Hello everyone and welcome back to the Barely Bookish Podcast. Today we are continuing on with Kindred and I am joined once again by Candace. Uh, this week we will be finishing up this episode, I promise. Or this chapter is what I meant, sorry. We're going to be finishing up this chapter. So without further ado, let's get right into the book and right into the discussion. So then Rufus starts heavily implying that Kevin has moved on from Dana. And I literally was like, I hope so. Because <laughs> I hate him. Seriously. Seriously. Dana can do better. So much better. Um, And then Rufus loses it on Dana and says he's been too lax on her because Dana's like, I'm not going to go talk to Alice for you. Mm-hmm. And he gets really scared. Yeah. And she's like, oh no, what am I dealing with here? I know. And I think mm-hmm. that's that was really the first time for Dana that she actually saw Rufus for who he's become. Like, I feel like the Alice situation kind of opened her eyes a little bit, but I feel like mm-hmm. this moment when he loses it on her was like, yep. oh, okay. Especially because he threatens Alice's life. Yeah. He's like, you know, I'm going to tell Jake Edwards, the new overseer, mm-hmm. that, um, that, that you, uh, that, I mean, that Alice is refusing to do what I tell her to do and beat and beat her to beat her into submission. Yeah. Essentially. And like, to me, that was even Tom Whalen doesn't deal in absolutes. Mm-hmm. Like t- when, when, when Dana gets hit, right. When he, when he whips her mm-hmm. in the previous chapter, he does it himself. Yeah. It's very, um, if you're into game of Thrones, it's very, mm-hmm. uh, how stark, Mm-hmm. Ned Stark actually that's actually one of the lessons he teaches his sons mm-hmm. like if you're going to be a fair and just ruler of this kingdom mm-hmm. right if you're going to be a steward of the north you have to you know do everything that you should do yourself mm-hmm. and carry that weight and carry that burden and look the man in his eyes when you you know when you have to mete out justice right he teaches him how to be noble and honorable mm-hmm. and it's 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 become increasingly more and more obvious as we move through all of this that Tom Whalen has his own code kind of his own understanding of what honorable is. It certainly does not match what we today feel is honorable by any stretch of the imagination or even really what people back then probably thought would be honorable. Um, But he does have standards. Mm -hmm. Rufus doesn't say I'm going to beat her into submission. He says he's going to have the overseer. Yeah. And it's like, Oh, okay. So you don't even want to, you don't even want to take responsibility. It's worse than just asking Dana to go to her on his behalf. Mm -hmm. He doesn't even want to like mete out his so-called punishment for not being, you know, more, you know, um, not for her not acquiescing to his his demands. I also feel like this Rufus gives me uh, rich kid vibes. Oh yeah, like for the fact that his dad does not have that much money, he is so spoiled. So spoiled. So spoiled. And I feel like Dana feeds into that un- unwittingly. Because she treats him like he's mm-hmm. special. He feels special because he summons her and she comes. Mm-hmm. The very nature of their relationship puts him in the driver's seat. You yeah. know what I mean? He has control. And I think that's something that she doesn't realize until this moment. Mm-hmm. For sure. So then after this all happens, Dana has to go down and talk to Alice. Because it's like she basically has to tell Alice tonight. You know? And the worst mm-hmm. part, too, is Alice made Dana a dress and was giving it to yep. her so that people stop pointing out that Dana is different and she stops being everyone's, like, center focus. Yep. And Dana's like, hey, you have to go into Rufus's room and basically let this happen. Otherwise, he's going to whip you and, like, seriously injure you. Yep. And after, like, Alice kind of has to come to terms with this. Like, she has... Alice lets it happen because, like, she knows it's going to happen no matter what she does. Yeah. And that's beyond sad. Yeah. Something that really was um, underscored for me in this part, too. It kind of harkens back to Sarah. So, Mm -hmm. something that is said about Sarah... I can't remember if it's in this particular section or if it's a little earlier in the chapter when Mm -hmm. she's talking to Sarah uh, before when Alice is still unconscious, but she talks about the mammy, right? Mm -hmm. She's like the mammy on this farm and um, she likens her to some characters from Uncle Tom's Cabin. So Uncle Mm -hmm. Tom's Cabin, obviously Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote that. 
Um, she, no spoilers, uh, I haven't read it yet. Oh, so it's it's intense. Okay. Um, that's going to be one that you're going to want to definitely uh, brace yourself for. Okay. Uh, because she is um, she's writing at a time when everybody was racist, mm-hmm. right? So what she's saying and what she is uh, what she's portraying mm-hmm. is commonplace right it's rote for the time like for example you'll look up and see you know plenty of people say that she was an abolitionist despite the fact that uncle tom's cabin is one of the most enduring examples of like grand racism mm-hmm. in in american literature right in and in, 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 in past american literature anyway mm-hmm. so um and again i'm sure you'll get to all that when you eventually read it mm-hmm. but um essentially there's a there's an archetype that is set up in there that I'm sure you've heard before in Uncle Tom, right? <laughs> Comes from Uncle Tom's cabin. And Uncle Tom is a black person from that time period. And even still today, people will call Kanye West an Uncle Tom. Mm-hmm. Um, and Uncle Tom is somebody who basically chooses to side with the oppressor. Okay. So, you know, somebody who will sell out a black person to a white person in order to be in better favor. That's essentially what it was, right? When a black slave would be like, you know, would, would kind of, you know, be very subservient mm-hmm. to, a, to a white person. And, you know, like you'll also hear like shucking and, and jiving, right? Which is like dancing and like being, you know, kind of frivolous mm-hmm. um, and leaning into the stereotype that white people have had about black people, both in the past and current times, um, that, you know, that they're lazy and that they're, you know, they're, they're roustabouts, they don't do much. I mean, mm-hmm. even, even up to like, if you watch Dumbo, Disney's Dumbo from the 30s, yeah. Um, or whenever, I'm sorry, I think it's set in the 30s, but whenever that 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 was made, it was actually way past the 30s, I'm pretty sure, I can't remember. But um, there's, a, there's a song, the working song, right? Mm-hmm. When when Dumbo is inside of his little cage and he's, you know, there's mm-hmm. like a rainstorm and everything. I, I'm sure that you remember it if you've seen the movie. But yeah. um, there are all of these men working on this train track. Mm-hmm. And if you look up the lyrics to that song, it will chill you to your core. Um, it's extra racist. And people still watch that movie like it's fine um, and have always watched that movie like it's fine. Like it's hugely problematic mm-hmm. and you can't really understand what they're saying when you watch it mm-hmm. and they're depicted as these like hulking dark skinned figures. So like they almost blend in with the background. They're so dark. You can't mm-hmm. even realize you, you can hear the clink of the, of the hammer on the metal mm-hmm. as they're doing their work, but you can't even really like, it's mostly about the elephant, right? Yeah. His journey. It's like narrating his journey up the mountain, but it's extraordinarily racist. I highly, highly suggest you look it up if you have a moment. Yeah, I've only um, seen Dumbo once. Oh, it's bad. Yeah, it's I've really also bad. never seen Bambi. Like, there was a lot of them that... Oh, Bambi is terrible. Don't waste your time. Yeah. <laughs> I was just like, my parents handpicked the Disney movies we were watching as children. Dumbo, yeah, Dumbo was not, is not on the list. No, it's not where it's at. But do yourself a favor and just look up the lyrics of the song. It's atrocious. All right. Um, But the reason I bring this up is because, like, that, that whole idea of, like, shucking and jiving or, like, really enjoying your work because, like you know, you want to make your massa happy or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Like any of that kind of stuff. That's kind of where this comes from, this idea. So there are these tropes, these archetypes, right? Um, Of the Uncle Tom, which would be like Uncle Ben's rice, right? Uncle Ben is like an Uncle Tom type character Mm -hmm. because he's there to cater to the white people. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Aunt Jemima, right? So obviously last year that was hugely addressed, Aunt Mm -hmm. Jemima and Uncle Ben, and how people have been using these these Black people's likenesses for a century and their families never received any money for it, Mm -hmm. right? And how it's a white owned company that wanted to like appeal to people like, oh, it's just like your mammy used to make, but not like your mammy, like your mom, your mammy, like the the, the black woman who raised you. Right. Um, Which happened a lot Mm -hmm. in this country until very recently. Um, So the mammy archetype, right, is kind of like the compliment to the Uncle Tom. The Uncle Tom is a man who, you know, is willing to sell people out and to kind of just do what white people want to do. The mammy is like Hattie McDaniel in Gone with the Wind, right? Mm-hmm. She's the, the the nurse maid, right? She raises the children, she cooks and cleans. Um, she, you know, is is very nice to her her owners or her employers later on in life mm-hmm. when slavery had ended. Um, she is somebody who is generally sexless. She's not a sexual person. Mm-hmm. She's not um, considered erotic in any way. She's harmless, mm-hmm. if you will. Um, but part of that harmlessness is that she has no agency, mm-hmm. right? There's nothing to fear from a mammy because she, you know, she doesn't have good sense in her head kind of thing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so 
Dana actually talks about that, right? She talks about like, oh, you know, like Sarah is the person that people would like people these days in the 70s would call a mammy because in the 70s, like the civil rights movement was still happening. The Black Panther Party was still very much a thing, Mm -hmm. right? And they did not hold with Uncle Tom's or mammy type people, right? Mm -hmm. Whether they were actual individuals who were acting that way and apologizing for the actions, the deplorable actions of white people or people that like from the past that were mammies or their portrayal in movies. Like for example, Hattie McDaniel, when she won the Academy Award, she was the first black person to ever win that achievement. It was a double-edged sword because she won it for playing this really offensive stereotype. Mm -hmm. So Dana's like, oh yeah, the stereotype, Sarah is that kind of person. You know, when Sarah says, oh, you know, these, these N words are so lazy, right? Mm -hmm. That's something that you, that, that, that like a a slave owner would say. Mm -hmm. And Dana's like, wait, why would you say that? Like, why would, why should they work hard? Yeah. Like, why should they work hard? They're not getting paid. Like, no one's paying them to be here. Mm -hmm. Like, why should they work hard? Like, this is a a lose-lose situation for literally everyone, including you. Mm -hmm. And Sarah's like, yeah, but like, my kids got sold. Yeah. There's, there's, there's repercussions here. Like, I'll get beat. Like, I'll lose my job. They'll sell me. Mm -hmm. They'll send me somewhere else. Like, I can't have that kind of, you know, turmoil at this point in my life. Like, I need to just kind of like keep an even keel. I have a daughter that is mute. Like, I have to be there for her. I have to be there for my family. So, like, Dana's just like, oh, I don't know. Like, people would have, like, written her off as a mammy. You know, she, she, you know, she's telling me to be quiet. She's telling me I need to watch my back instead Mm -hmm. of telling me, hey, you need to get out of here. You need to run. You need to do this. You need to do that. And being more, you know, um, understanding and be, and wanting her to leave and wanting her to, like, you know, like, press her luck. Yeah. And fight, right? She's Mm -hmm. like, no. Why would you do that? Don't do that. And she judges her for it. Like, Dana judges her for Mm -hmm. it harshly. Oh, yeah. And then she comes back around to this point. Mm-hmm. And this is the moment that I was just like, I cried so hard. I cried so hard. I don't want to cry right now. I'm going to fucking call. Yeah. <laughs> I cried so hard because Dana realizes how easy it is to slide into that stereotype mm-hmm. completely unwittingly because she goes to Alice and she's like, hey, man, you can't fight. And as she's telling her all of these things, hey, it's going to happen to you whether you want it to or not. It's better if you just put up with it. he'll you know he'll at least be nice make him respect you by giving him what he wants right Mm -hmm. she's giving her this advice and it is the exact same advice that she gets from fucking sarah in the beginning of this book when she first arrives at the waylon house Mm -hmm. and like she's saying it and it's making her sick to her stomach because she knows and in that moment right she realizes like and we all realize too as the reader how easy it is to fall into that habit because you're genuinely concerned mm-hmm. about the well-being of this person. Like yeah. Butler does an incredible job, right, of trying to kind of sum up what it's like to be an enslaved person. It's like in real time, right, now or day, let's say you are put into a room, right? Somebody takes you, puts you in a room with no windows and, and only one door. Mm-hmm. And the door is locked and you have no key. All you know is that room. Mm-hmm. Three years go by. All you know is that room. Ten years go by. All you know is that room, right? Mm -hmm. So when someone comes in and tells you it's nighttime, you just believe them. Yeah. Because you can't tell if it's not nighttime and you have no way of knowing if it's nighttime. You can't leave and walk outside. Mm -hmm. So you can either not believe them and go crazy because you're still locked in this fucking room. Mm -hmm. Or you can go, okay, cool. No problem. It's nighttime. Mm -hmm. And just accept it, right? And keep living your life. And hopefully they won't get angry with you for asking too many questions. Well, it's like people look down on people with like stockholm syndrome but yeah it's, like, it's the same it's very similar yeah it's you don't know yeah how would they know or like i i also i remember like someone talking about a kid being like groomed to then being you know an adult who is with yep. and it's like they look down on this kid and i'm like how would this kid who is groomed like from like 14 15 to now being a 23 year old and they're like well they're 23 they should know better how would they know better they've been yeah they've had no opportunity to learn yeah it's like of course and like if if someone tells you Mm -hmm. right like like elizabeth smart elizabeth smart when she tried to escape she was told oh well it's dangerous outside Mm -hmm. oh well you're wanted criminal oh here are a list of reasons why you shouldn't try to escape and then it's on her to decide whether or not she's still going to fight. Was that the, it's on her to decide, you know. Hmm? Was that the girl that was kept at like the neighbor's house? Yeah. Okay. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So she didn't, she didn't know. She had no reason. She had no basis mm-hmm. for comparison. You know, they told her, hey, you can't leave the house. It's not safe. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. 
You know what I mean? What are you supposed to do? The only reason that I think she was able to leave is because they would occasionally take her out in public. So they couldn't like lie to her completely about the world Mm -hmm. and what was going on because they'd occasionally take her out. And like, she was so brainwashed that she wouldn't fight while she was out because she felt like it was just, there was no point. Yeah. Right. There was no reason to. So that's what I'm saying. This is happening on a larger scale, Mm -hmm. right. To these people that are enslaved. And you know, a lot of people, like some some very racist theorists um, in the past have argued that like the care and keeping and transportation of slaves wasn't free. And therefore, you know, um, you know, maybe there is, you know, money that like the reason that there's no reparations is because those slave owners had to pay to house and feed all these slaves. And it's like, so what? Elizabeth Smart owes people money because they kidnapped her and they fed her yeah, and they clothed her. I don't think so. You know what I'm saying? Like, so Sarah is there. She believes nobody makes it out alive. Like mm-hmm. if we think about her perspective, right? Even even her journey. She sees people try to leave. She saw her sons try to fight, they got sold. Mm-hmm. She sees Luke try to fight, he gets sold. Mm-hmm. She sees Nigel try to fight. He gets brought back and broken. Mm-hmm. So that he doesn't have to get sold, mm-hmm. right? Technically he is sold though because he's gifted to uh Rufus. Yeah. He's almost sold Tom's though. Slave. Right. He was yeah. almost sold. And then you look at Isaac. So Sarah, in her world, in her purview, yeah. anytime you try to leave, you get caught. Why would I try to leave? I need to make the best out of this shitty situation, mm-hmm. right? So like a lot of people, you know, especially like I said, in the 60s and 70s, when like, you know, black thought was something that like was really starting to be something that people were waking up and caring about. And, you know, people were really talking about, you know, the, the you know, the politicization of, of black bodies mm-hmm. and what slavery means. And people started kind of doing all of this research. Again, like, I mean, I, I took a class where we had to talk about, you know, the different tropes of African, African-American people and how they've been portrayed in media. Mm-hmm. And it's rough because you've got like, you know, another one is the Jezebel, right? This, this super sexed up, super hot black lady mm-hmm. that like is gonna, you know, like, just like get your get your gears, you know, grind into whatever, like a Foxy Brown, like black exploitation films, right? Mm-hmm. And all these different roles. Um, and that's how these slave owners were able to kind of just like give themselves permission to have sex with these women. They would say that all the time. Oh, well, she was so seductive. She seduced me. Yeah. If she didn't want me, then she shouldn't have looked at me like that. She's looking at you like she wants to slit your throat and can't. Yeah. Like, I don't know what you're seeing in her eyes. It's whatever you want to see. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So it's so interesting to like, see this person, meaning Sarah, right? See her just go like freedom versus safety. Like to every other person, freedom is safety. Mm Mm-hmm. Like freedom is safety. You are safe when you are free because you are in charge of your body and you are in charge of your person and you can go wherever you need to go, Mm -hmm. right? You can leave, you can walk away. But to her, freedom is not safety at all. It's violence. Yeah. And like, that is so scary and like so powerful. Like Luke is like the most careful person, right? Luke is the one who's always like, you know, talking Sarah off the ledge, right? Mm -hmm. In the previous chapter when, you know, Dana goes like the second or third time, right? She's like, oh, hey, you know, Luke is like, hey, man, you got to calm down. Like, you can't be saying that. We don't want you. To, we don't want you to get in trouble. Mm-hmm. Right. He's talking to her in such a way that like one would probably go, oh, and Uncle Tom, he's trying to keep her down, whatever. Mm-hmm. Right. She was spicy. She was fiery. And now she's like, I'm staying put. Yeah. Because the person that was the one to talk her off the ledge got sold. Yeah. Like he was her pinnacle of like a person that is making the best out of things mm-hmm. and it didn't keep him safe. Yeah. He's still sold. Like I, the moment that Dana realizes that the things that she's saying to Alice make her that mammy archetype. Mm-hmm. Like I, I was like, I had never thought about that before. I had never thought about that before about like what your options are, mm-hmm. what your choices are. Like when you start reading about the middle, if you, if you ever decide that you want to start reading about like, the middle passage, right? The journey mm-hmm. from Africa to the other places that, you know, slaves were dropped off and distributed. Mm-hmm. There are all kinds of stories about slave rebellions on the ships. A lot of times they would just, they wouldn't even make it, mm-hmm. you know, like one slave would break out. They would get everybody else free. All these African people, they'd get themselves free mm-hmm. and then they would jump overboard. All kinds of people lost at sea to sharks, to drowning, to, you know, orcas, to whatever creature, Mm -hmm. you know, in the deep that found their bodies, right? Women murdering their babies in their cradle because they don't want them to grow up in this duress, in this, in this, like, horror, you know what I mean? In this, in this, in this shit show. And like, that's something that has been entirely erased Mm -hmm. in our history, you know what I mean? And minimized to the point where like, even this woman in 1976 is like, I would never be a mammy. And then turns around and is like, hey, can you just kind of like sleep with him even though you don't want to? Yeah. 
like what the fuck i know i think the realization that it's how easy it is to fall into complacency because you know you have no other choice is that's the thing i don't think you're ever complacent because complacency even like the word complacent is like meh i could take it or leave it. i feel like that was the wrong word definitely like it's it's like i mean uh, not i'm not trying to like say that you're no. saying the wrong thing or whatever I'm just i just saying, don't know like, the right word i'm looking for like i get where you're coming yeah. from though because you're just like you know it's like monotony almost but like more insidious you know yeah. what i mean like like i don't even think we have a word for that you know yeah because it's yeah. like you're falling into this like you don't have a choice so make the best of it but even then it's yeah. like you can't i don't know i don't think there's a word for that actually yeah I, I, I don't think so either like i'm really searching my brain right now and the closest i'm coming up to is that you're i mean paralyzed i guess is the closest word that i can think of because yeah. i mean your whole family gets sold and it's just you on a farm with your one daughter who can't speak and every mm-hmm. day somebody comes along and tells you that they might sell her too like what's the word for that yeah I don't know. Like, that's insane. It's insane. Yeah. I just... And then the worst part, too, is, like, then having to see Alice come down after. Yeah. Yeah. Because Dana had to talk her into it. Yep. And it's like she doesn't feel like she has a choice. Like, there is, no one has a choice in this. Yep and no one except for rufus except yeah (laughs) hate rufus what an idiot but it's like you have to just be like make the best of it good luck like and then alice is just broken like mentally emotionally when she comes back and it's like also dana has to kind of be like hey for me to ever exist have fun up there yeah you know and yeah it's 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 a her or me mentality mm -hmm. and like that's the last thing that she wants yeah but like dana too also probably wants to be like hey just we'll run away but also then we'll both die like you just got back and you were only gone five days and i think that's horrifying to me too is you know after that moment when she's coming to terms with she had to basically do the same thing sarah's did she also is like i need to run away she's already seen how bad it goes at least she has the back you know the backing that if she runs away and she gets hurt at least she'll go back to 1976 like there's no real repercussions for dana because yeah yeah, she's gonna be really injured but she's gonna go back home she doesn't have to face the majority of the consequences Right. I mean, I would argue, though, that, like, she doesn't know what those are. That's true. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, does she just cease to exist if she doesn't send her to him? Because it's clear she hasn't had a baby thus far. Yeah. And she's not pregnant. So, like, does she just vanish? Mm-hmm. Like, what does that mean for her her livelihood? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And, and like, the fact that, like, I, I will say, though, like, it, it was... It's hard. It's, like, it's, like, it's, like, not... It isn't a positive thing, mm-hmm. right? But it's almost like a, a sense of relief mm-hmm. that happens that like this lady is able to kind of like speak her truth to Dana, however angry she is. Like mm-hmm. Alice, like Alice, like digs in, man. She rips her a new butt, mm-hmm. man. She like goes crazy when she's talking to her. Mm-hmm. You know how dare you? Like you know what do you think this is? How can you do this to me? Like she basically gives her the exact same derision that Dana had for like that mammy stereotype. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, she's just like, how can you do this to your own people? And then you have this white husband. Like she is so, I mean, nothing she's saying is wrong, but she's harsh. Yeah. Like she's harsh. And even then she apologizes. Mm -hmm. And to me, like there's such humanity in the characters that are, that are enslaved. Right. Mm -hmm. There's such humanity between all of them. You know what I mean? Like they're all talking to each other. They're all supporting each other, even though, there's betrayal even though there is a sense of i don't know impermanence Mm -hmm. because you know nothing is in their control they still strive to create bonds Mm -hmm. right even then like alice stops what she's doing she's like hey i'm tearing you up and dana's like yeah and i have feelings like Mm -hmm. i'm trying to help you i'm really sorry like it's not awesome like can you think about how it feels for me to have to tell you this for your own good Mm -hmm. like that's gross 
and she finally calms down and like acquiesces and just kind of like goes for it yeah but like you know again she went to him she adjusted became a quieter more subdued person Mm -hmm. she didn't kill but she died a little like i had to put the book down when i read that sentence i had to put it down i had to walk away and i had i had to i had to put it down because like that's the price like that's the price that's the price she's paying for her life Mm -hmm. her price is that she's dying a little yeah and that's an atrocity i was reading this chapter while i was at work and imagine after putting this down the reading this i I then went to like serve tables and i was like no (laughs) it was really hard because i was like none of this matters right now you know what i mean (laughs) Like, I just read something so haunting. And then, like, yeah. people are complaining that we're out of grouper. I was like, uh, I don't care. <laughs> Priorities, people. Yeah, I was like, Priorities. No, yeah, your I troubles don't you. bother me at this point. I absolutely feel you on that. Mm-hmm. It's very difficult, like, to, to give a shit. It's funny, too, because um, Roxane Gay, right? Famed author and uh, and theorist. Mm-hmm. Um I read I read her her article that she wrote. She wrote an op ed after she watched The Help. Mm-hmm. Right, great read. It's on the Rumpus, uh, her old website um, that she has like a collective of writers and stuff that she's with. Mm-hmm. And it's called The Rumpus. Um, definitely look it up if you haven't read it. Mm-hmm. Um, but basically, there's a part where she talks about um, cause it's all about how people really love The Help and why they really what they're what they're missing. Mm-hmm. Right, the parts that they're not seeing, which I think this book actually fills that in mm-hmm. pretty well. Um, because obviously the women in the help are just, are, are all descendants, black and white. They're all descendants from people that would be like in this book. You know what yeah. I mean? So I think reading this and then reading the help will help anybody who thinks that, that is like a really good and sweet and kind hearted, um, and emotional book, um, recognize that it's actually a little bit of a disaster. So, um, like she, <laughs> she goes to the movie theater and she watches the movie. And then after people are like trying to talk to her about it <laughs> and she said, I don't want to see any white people unless i love you i don't want to see i don't want to talk to i don't want to hear from Mm -hmm. i don't want to know about any white people for at least three days i need time yep i need time i need time and it's hilarious because you're basically like saying the same thing listen yeah rick i don't care about your grouper Uh, yeah this woman died a little <laughs> the awkward car ride home after Daniel and I watched the Get Out. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. That's a vibe. I know. That's a and it's like, <laughs> you know, there's a little bit of just, huh, how you doing over there? I'm, I'm, We're going to talk about it. <laughs> can we talk about it tomorrow. Like, it's, yeah. A little bit of that going on. Yeah, man. I actually heard that that was like a that was like a like an international um, phenomenon. Anybody that's in an interracial relationship with a black partner and a white partner, apparently everybody was kind of like, "Hmm." Have you not after- watched it yet? <laughs> I did. Okay. I watched it after a lot of people watched mm-hmm. it because I didn't want like the hype. Yeah. I spent the majority of the movie um, standing on my sofa in a crouched position, mm-hmm. ready to flee at any moment because my anxiety was so high. Yeah. Like, there's a lot of that movie hits different when you're a black person. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of people don't realize that. Or if you have black people in your life that you love and that you know that are comfortable talking to you about their experiences, right? Like, mm-hmm. I'm sure it hits different for you than it does someone who might have a white partner and is white themselves, right? Mm-hmm. Because there's only so much that you can understand when it's like a friend. But when it's somebody that you love, mm-hmm. right? And their anxiety, like, and you can feel it, especially being as, together as long as you've been. You know, like Jason the whole time was like, my anxiety, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, Because I was like, <laughs> I know. Know. <laughs> like, um, first five minutes of the movie i was like oh they're they call this get out because that's what i'm gonna scream for an hour and 57 yep. minutes or however long it is <laughs> yeah yeah it was weird because we watched it with i i believe we were both interracial couples but i think we watched it with our friend that's hispanic and his white partner at the time mm-hmm. they're they're broken up now that's a long story um <laughs> But like it, it wasn't as weird for them. But for Daniel yeah. and I, we're both like, "Ooh, yeah." We we're just like, "Let's just it's a doozy." Yeah, and I'm just gonna sit over here, and you can sit over there. And we like didn't talk on the car ride home. We we're just both processing what we just witnessed. We we're like, "Okay, yeah. 
I like media that kind of forces you to examine things like that, though. Mm -hmm. Like, it really is awesome to be able to kind of do a little bit of a deeper dive. Mm -hmm. um, because I think that, like, it helps to kind of connect um, connect the dots to, like, what's happening in, in our society, mm -hmm. right? And especially having having been made and, like, written and directed by, you know, um, by uh, Jordan Peele, mm -hmm. right? He is somebody who's biracial. So he comes from a family that is two different races, mm -hmm. right? So like he understands straddling that line, you know, of otherness and being the same and being accepted and then excluded. I still need to see his new one, his new horror movie. Us? Yeah, yeah, I still haven't seen that one. It's interesting. It's not as deep as Get Out, but it's pretty good. I feel like Get I Out, anyway. I, if I watched it now, I'd have a lot different reaction too. Because I watched it when it came out. And again, I haven't I had at that point done any sort of like racism. I don't think you will. Really? No, I think you're gonna have the same reaction, if not a worse one. No, I think it would be worse. No, 100 yeah. worse. Yeah, yeah, I know. Because you're gonna you're gonna notice everything. Yeah, because I think I I didn't <laughs> notice a lot when I watched it. Yeah. I was just like, oh, this is scary, you know, like yeah, and just like it was scarier the second time for me. I think you see it coming. Yeah, this one would if I watched it again now, like because you would, I would notice a lot more of like the power play too that I yes. didn't notice when I watched it the first time. I was like, oh, they happen Absolutely. to be white. They happen to be black. And, yeah. You know. Cause you're taking it in stride. You're like, oh, that's weird. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, that's strange. I was like, oh, how terrifying, yeah. you know? But yeah. had I watched it now and like the knowledge I have now, I think I could have yeah. read a lot more into things and that would have been scarier. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, that's how I felt. That's how I feel about this book. Because mm -hmm. again, like I've read this book twice before mm -hmm. this is my third reading right um my first reading i was 20 years old i was in college i was a, a, a junior in college mm -hmm. my second reading i think was in my mid-20s maybe late 20s and now i am 37 and reading this again right and the amount of craziness mm -hmm. and racism and awfulness right so when i read this book the first time we had never had a black president just to give like an understanding of what I mean when I say like a lot has happened since mm -hmm. then, right? We did not have a black president when I read this book the first time, mm -hmm. okay? So then the second time that I read this book, I did have a black president and it hit different, mm -hmm. obviously, because I'm like, progress, man, we're going to change everything. It's going to be great. Mm -hmm. And now I'm reading it and I'm like, okay, so last year people started getting serious about racism, mm -hmm. not 20 years ago when I read it the first time, but now mm -hmm. people are getting serious, right? And like that moment where Rufus, where we realize that Rufus has been rewarded for his deceit, mm -hmm. right? Like you were saying before, when Rufus, we realize that Rufus has purchased her and he's basically, he's purchased Alice and basically has like orchestrated a moment mm -hmm. where he did the wrong thing and still benefits from mm -hmm. it, right? Like he has created a horrible situation. Like he tried to force her to sleep with him, right? He tries to rape this woman. Mm -hmm. She is free, right? Again, not his property. Not that that would make it better if she were, but it's like even more nefarious that she's free, mm -hmm. right? That means he feels ultimate ownership over her because she is a woman mm -hmm. and because she is black, not because she's a slave. So we've got this moment where he sets it up. He has tries to have sex with her, possibly was successful, mm -hmm. right? Beats her up in the process, bloodies her face. Mm -hmm. Her man takes offense, which it is his right to, yeah. because he's defending his wife, mm -hmm. and he goes after him. He gets so Rufus gets his ass handed to him by Isaac, right? And is immediately like, "Vengeance will be mine," right? Yeah. He's talked down. Vengeance is not his, but it still is because then he goes and buys her, knowing she is not a slave, mm -hmm. and makes her a slave anyway, right? So he is rewarded for visiting terror upon these two individuals, mm -hmm. which was his fault. It is his fault he gets his ass beat. It is his fault Alice doesn't want him. It is like, all of this is his fault. This is all his orchestrated plan. Mm -hmm. And then I look at Kyle Rittenhouse and I go, this is a man who packed some guns, drove across state lines to enter a situation that he had nothing to do with. Mm -hmm. He had no skin in that game. He was not a shop owner. He didn't have a house. He didn't have family and friends that were, that were being attacked. He just wanted to get in the fray. Mm -hmm. He goes into Wisconsin armed to a peaceful protest where it's already been proved that a lot of people that were violent at the Black Lives Matter rallies mm -hmm. were alt-right people, mm -hmm. right? Proud Boys, QAnon Shaman, for example, who's now in jail because of his involvement in the January 6th uh, Capitol riot. 
right? All these people were inciting violence, which we know they did because he's been indi- he's been indicted now mm-hmm. for doing the same at our capital, at our nation's capital, the seat of power, right? Yeah. So he goes, so Kyle Rittenhouse goes into this environment with a gun, terrorizes people with that gun, threatens to shoot them, mm-hmm. shoots three people, murdering two, mm-hmm. all of whom were unarmed, and then is like, it was self-defense. And it's like, okay, so then you made this situation Mm -hmm. that was already simmering. You increased the temperature by adding guns to it. Mm -hmm. And then you shot somebody. Who's coming at you? Who's coming at somebody with a gun? Yeah. That has no weapons. You know what I'm saying? So he made up a situation, Mm -hmm. made it worse, killed somebody, and is still not facing charges for that. It's exactly what Rufus does. Mm -hmm. He creates an impossible situation for everybody involved and then gets away with it. And I don't understand how it's been, I mean, literally 200 years Mm -hmm. (laughs) since this moment is happening in this book. And we're still seeing that same validating behavior Mm -hmm. take place in our society. Like, it's so bizarre to read it now versus when I read it the first time or the second time. Like, it is wild. Yeah. I know it's and I I think I'm lucky too that I get to read it now whereas I had I read this like high school me read this I would not been able to have these conversations you know because I don't know anything at that I didn't know anything at that point and so it's like I get to engage with this literature very differently and I'm interested to see like when I if I read it again 10 years from now more things that i would like realize and want to discuss about it yeah and i i like that octavia butler did such a good job that we can still discuss it now yeah you know it's it's just as relevant Mm -hmm. and it's it's so funny too because when you start reading dana's like i'm a modern woman Mm -hmm. and i'm sitting here at a computer like you're a modern woman you sweetheart i don't even have email not even the AOL kind. Oh my god. I read when I was reading Rebecca and Rebecca's supposed to be like this modern woman. Yeah. I was trying to But I still need a husband. The worst part like, too oh, is no. I could not figure out if it was written in like the eighteen hundreds or if they had cars. Like there was a right. there's a big part of the first episode where we're trying to figure out what year this was set in. Yeah. Cause it's a modern woman of when this book was published. Right. And we were not given any <laughs> what dates. Exactly does that mean? Yeah, man. So we had to like Google what year the book came out to know how quote modern she was yep yep absolutely so back to the book um at this point rufus is like raping alice regularly and beating her and dana's had enough Mm -hmm. she does not trust rufus at all finally um and Alice finds the letters that Dana s- sent, s- supposedly, and was like, "Hey, he never he sent never these letters." Yep, never mailed them. And that's what I'm saying. It's so easy for him to lie to her. It's so easy for him to lie to her. And like, how betrayed must she feel? Mm-hmm. She goes to Alice to a help save this girl's life in any way she can, mm-hmm. and b assure that she's at least going to like exist right? And that history is not going to get messed up. Mm -hmm. And then C, right? And this is like, obviously, like, she's trying to like, meet Rufus halfway. Mm -hmm. You're going to be a monster, apparently, no matter what I do. Mm -hmm. So what can I do to at least slightly mitigate this? She thinks that that he's at least on the level, and that he's being honest with her, Mm -hmm. right? That that understanding that he hopefully isn't lying to me, right? Mm -hmm. Is something that she really digs in and relies on for much of this book so far, Mm -hmm. right? And all of a sudden, Alice is like, hey, he's just like every other one. Yeah. He lies just like all of them. Here are your letters. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, oh. I know. And it also kind of says something that Rufus didn't burn them. Yeah. Like, brave. Wow. Okay. Like, he didn't think he was going to get caught. Yeah. It didn't even occur to him. It didn't even occur to him. And how sick is it that he kept them, too? Yeah. Yeah. What kind of person does that? Right? I know. It's like... Does he read them? I don't he said know. Because she said the seals were all broken. Yeah. So, like, what? I don't I don't even know what that could 
I don't, I don't know what to do with that, to be honest. Like that just kind of sits at me and I know it means something, but I, I can't even understand what kind of person would do that. Like he doesn't throw them away. He doesn't burn them. He just lets them sit there. Yep. Horrifying. Yep. Yep. So, I mean, what happens next is like, no surprise in my i know opinion. so dana the least surprising part of this book. yeah immediately as soon as she sees the letters decides she's running around that night yep. uh when everyone is asleep and she, i like that the author immediately was like this was my first mistake like yeah holding no punches yep dana immediately admits that i fucked up guys yeah dana yeah. is on the move uh she's trying to stay out of sight but she did have to hit a dog already Mm-hmm. Um, and then immediately, like she's just down the road. Rufus and Tom are already on horseback looking for her, and I was like, "Oh no! Oh no! Oh no! Oh no!" Yep. Uh, and they found her so quickly. Uh, and they knock her out, but uh, she is like on the back of his horse like she wakes up very quickly after and she's on the back yep. of rufus's horse and like rufus is like still trying to weirdly be her friend this entire yeah. time it's like just be super awkward yeah he's like just like deal with it but he was the one that found her in the bushes she was hidden in the bushes he's like oh there she is yep and runs yep. his if horse he hadn't, if he hadn't said anything mm-hmm. they would have been fine yep and like that's the thing too right He's so paranoid mm-hmm. and so twisted mm-hmm. that it doesn't even occur to him that she shows up whether she wants to or not. She already doesn't have a choice to be there. Mm-hmm. Her running away, eventually she's going to come back. Like, eventually she'll be there again. He knows this. Mm-hmm. And he still is like, nah, I'm going to get her. Yeah. And like, I mean, even even her comfort, right? Her comfort level. Mm-hmm. She's like, oh, I make my own time. Right? When she talks about the people who are doing things on, you know, at, at the farm. She's like, I... You know, I make my own time mm-hmm. and uh, no one ever questions what I'm doing or what I'm not doing or whether or not I'm doing my job because, you know, I don't have a specific job. Everybody knows that and it's fine. I can go wherever I want and do whatever I want. Mm-hmm. No one ever notices, right? But like the only other person that that is afforded that freedom is Alice. Mm-hmm. And she obviously pays dearly for that, mm-hmm. right? And even then, Alice is doing jobs that she's really good at. That there's already other people doing, like that one lady. Uh, I think her name's Liza, mm-hmm. right? That took over the um, the sewing and the washing and stuff after um, uh, old Aunt Mary. That's like the, the elderly woman mm-hmm. or whatever. That you know, she's obviously past her prime. They're just waiting for her to die, kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, she's the, she's the one who like steps in and, and fills that fills that role. This other person, and then Alice is there and she's doing what she can. And just like everybody has contempt for. A little like a lot of people on the you know there have contempt for Dana. Mm-hmm. People are starting to have contempt for Alice because Alice also gets to do whatever she wants and she can you know go where she wants to go and do the job she wants mm-hmm. to do even if someone else is doing them. You know, so I think that like Dana is thinking to herself, well, you know, things are bad, but they're not the worst. Mm-hmm. And to me, like that's a that's a level of 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 I don't know qualification i guess Mm -hmm. like that i can't i can't get my head around that like you're in a moment where like there's two awful situations in front of you Mm -hmm. and you can actually go well that one's not as bad as this one yeah like but both of them are impossible Mm -hmm. like that's mind-boggling yeah this is really the rock in a hard place yep so then they get her back and tom beats her and she knows she's not going to die, so she gets she's still stuck there. Like yep. the whole qualification for her going back is her thinking she's going to die. Like she yep. has to put herself in a situation where she fears for her life to be sent yes. back. Yes, and it's increasingly difficult mm-hmm. because I think like it's it's kind of implied like that like Butler doesn't say this in so many words, but I think is the reader mm-hmm. we're we're kind of. Um, we're building this understanding and this knowledge of the circumstances of this time travel, mm-hmm. right? As as this is going on. Like Dana's kind of living it. So there's only so much that she can really recognize, but even this, she's lucid enough to recognize that like the longer she stays there, mm-hmm. the longer she's there. Like yeah. the longer like every every moment that she is 
on this farm. And again, I keep saying farm because it is not a plantation. A plantation is like a rolling field mm-hmm. with like, you know what I mean? Um, this is more of a farm yeah. because they're poor people. But like, she, the longer she stays at the farm, the more she gets to know the Waylands, the mm-hmm. more she gets to know Rufus, the more that she witnesses these other enslaved people going through these this these, these horrors, right? This These traumas. Mm-hmm the more she recognizes her place in all of it. And because of that, she's not going to think that she's going to get killed. You know what I'm Mm -hmm. saying? It's going to take a lot. It's going to take a stranger probably for her to feel like she's going to die because she doesn't think she knows that she's valuable to these two people Mm -hmm. and that they ultimately kind of need her. So she's never going to be, you know what I'm saying? So at that point, like I read that and I was just like, damn, she got like, she, she lost her fight. She lost a little bit of her fight, Mm -hmm. man. A, a, a piece of her fight was taken from her. I know. Like, we know that she loses her arm, but she also loses her fight because, like, all that she was clinging to before was, well, something bad is going to happen and I'm going to get sent home. Mm-hmm. And now bad things are happening, but they're not extreme enough to cause her actual harm. I know. And that's the worst part for like, me, too. It's like, oh, she's getting used to this. Yeah. And that's scary. Like, what the fuck? Mm-hmm. But at the same time, again, I think that, like, her and Aunt Sarah. I feel like that's really the the, the best parallel. Mm-hmm. Like we think at the beginning that her parallel is going to be Alice. Mm-hmm. And, in a, and in a way I think it is like, I think that, you know, Alice is, is a foil, well not a foil, but like a, a good person to compare her to mm-hmm. like a, like a, someone who's akin to her because Alice does have that fight. Mm-hmm. It does occur to Alice to strive to do as much as she can to get herself out of that situation. Right. She does. She tries, mm-hmm. but like, I feel like Sarah is really the one that we recognize that she grows to be the most like Mm -hmm. because Sarah recognizes that she it's it's like, it's like talking to a battered woman, Mm -hmm. right? Talking to a woman whose, whose partner hits her. Mm -hmm. She's like, well, sometimes he loves me. Well, sometimes it's not that bad. Mm -hmm. Well, it's better than the alternative, right? None of those are positive things. Mm -hmm. You should never have to put up with any of it, right? It's all bad. Mm -hmm. You can't say, oh, well, today it wasn't as bad because he just pushed me. Mm -hmm. He shouldn't be pushing you at all, Yeah, right? That shouldn't ever happen. So now Dana is in this position where she's like, well, it could be worse. Well, I'm not going to die. Well, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's horrible. It's almost like she's unlearning what she understands about the actual world Mm -hmm. at this point. She's so deeply steeped in this. It's it's a nightmare well, it's that she cannot like, wake up from. Thing too is you got to think about it is like most of us deal with just like the monotony of day to day. You know, we go through life. No day is really that different from yesterday. Yep. And like she's having this very visceral like every day is different. Every day is terrifying. Like no wonder that like that's gonna feel more like reality than the reality she comes from. Absolutely. Because it's like everything's vivid and sharp and scary. And it's like yeah. she has to think and survive. Whereas, like, you come back to 1976, the walls are still the blue you left them, and mm-hmm. you know nothing changes. Like that's going to feel right. like fake world, right? And I think that like it's interesting because in so many books, like you get character growth, right? Mm-hmm. You don't get character regression, mm-hmm. but this is regression for her. <laughs> You know what I mean? She's somebody who in life takes risks. Mm -hmm. She goes where she wants. She does what she wants. She works this whatever temp job because she wants to, because it allows her to have more flexibility to do what she likes to do. Mm -hmm. Right? Like she is this person who owns herself. Like she owns herself. She owns the world around her. Like she's a rebel and a renegade. When you think about the fact that she's a black woman in 1976, that's married to a white man. Like there's a lot happening. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot that this book tells us about her that like, she's an interesting and, and capable and inventive and innovative human being mm-hmm. right in her original life and now that's being slowly just like 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 leached from her mm-hmm. right over time the more she acclimates and the more she you know finds a way to be okay the more that she's able to calm her mind right and stop panicking all the time and stop being in this constant state of bewilderment and mm-hmm. terror the harder it is for her to return. And again, like, I feel like that's a huge allegory for slavery in general, mm-hmm. like a huge metaphor for slavery in general, but specifically Sarah's journey. Yeah. Because that's exactly what happened, what happens to her. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? Like she gets eaten away at bit by bit by bit, including like taking actual pieces of her in the form of her children until finally there's nothing left of her other than somebody who just obeys. Mm-hmm. Like that's horrifying. Absolutely. So after Dana gets taken back and she is 
be in uh rufus apparently insisted uh, that they take good care of dana and clean all her wounds thoroughly which mm-hmm. bare minimum the bars on the floor yep um then we find something that is meaningful though is that alice is like hey we're gonna take care of you as good as you took care of me yeah and you recognize that there's like that sisterhood yeah there and that bond and to me that was really beautiful that was a really beautiful moment especially knowing like alice forgives her for Mm -hmm. what she had to do and understands like especially looking at her all bloody and bruised what the alternative was Mm -hmm. you know what i mean Mm -hmm. yeah the next part though is that we find out liza was the one who turned her in because she was getting pushed out by alice but it leads to my favorite part which is carrie and alice uh beating the living daylights out of liza yep i was like Tom Whalen's like what happened to you you tell me and i'll get him and she's like mm, yeah fell fell i was like i fell oops oh no get what you deserve liza listen because there was, cause there was like, no reason like it's not like liza was protecting herself like she did that maliciously and yeah. so carrie and uh alice were like you want to see malicious like love that for you ladies yep get them yep yep that was the best because it like that was the best because it shows that like carrie and alice actually care about dana which i loved like me too get them all i gotta say like that's it that's it like oh well you know oh well solidarity man and like and, and that's oh, and that test, I think is tested it too. Sorry, yeah. I forgot. Oh yeah, the washerwoman test. Yeah. So that's what I'm saying too. I think that like because Dana gets really concerned mm-hmm. about how she's perceived because of going to Alice and having that conversation. Mm-hmm. But I feel like that is a moment where these three women are like, we're gonna do whatever we want to do. Mm-hmm. Like you might not be able to fight right now, but we can fight. Mm-hmm. And like it's good because like in the beginning it was really Dana who was doing the fighting. You know what I mean? That's how mm-hmm. she got her first beating. Was that she was like, yeah, I'm going to teach you how to read. Mm-hmm. Yes, that's going to make you more powerful. Do you want me to write you a, a pass to the north? Like, she, at first, she's like, whatever, I'm fucking all the tropes. Yeah. I don't care what you're doing. I don't care about your rules. You know what I mean? Yeah. She gets really, like, into it. She's like, fuck everything. I'm going crazy. Mm-hmm. And people are like, hey, that's not the way. You've got to, like, fool them from the inside out. Mm-hmm. And, you know, even when you look at, like, Jim Crow and, like, the civil rights movement later on, right, you realize that a lot of it, like, people always talk about how Martin Luther King, like, oh, like, People who are, you know, who are a lot, lately it's been a lot of conservatives Mm -hmm. talking about, well, even Dr. King, you know, he was a big proponent of peace and he's talking about peace and like, we shouldn't have protests and we shouldn't have all this violence and whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, all right, well, first of all, that was one way that that man felt. Mm -hmm. That wasn't his entire speech. That wasn't his entire doctrine. Right. Like Dr. King wasn't just like, oh yeah, they can totally like beat you and attack you with dogs and you don't resist, man. You just do whatever. No, 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 no. That, that wasn't his purpose. Mm-hmm. His purpose was, this is the preferred way to go about mm-hmm. securing your freedom and equality and equity. Mm-hmm. Not, this is the only way to do that. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So when Alice and Tess and uh, and Carrie are like, hey, don't worry about it. We've got you. We're going to make sure that that doesn't ever fucking happen to you again. And she's like, Dana's like, hey, do me a favor. Please don't get in trouble on my behalf. They're like, don't tell us what to do. I was like, okay. Yep. All right, sis. Get them. Enough said. Get Turn on. the page. Literally. <laughs> I was like, mm, mind your business. The fist bump <laughs> I had in the air when I read that part. Yeah. Ugh. Listen, girl squad for life. Literally. <laughs> so after even freaking Tom yelled at Rufus, Rufus still didn't send any letters. So Tom wrote to Kevin and Kevin immediately wrote back that he's coming. Mm-hmm. And Dana also told Rufus she knows he lied. Yep. And I was like, get him, girl. Yep. Get him, girl. Kevin shows yep. up. Nothing else important happened at that point. Uh, uh, the first time that we've ever been happy to see him. Literally. And only then, even a little, just a little just bit. Just a little bit. Like, I honestly... Just because Dana's happy. Yeah, that's it. Honestly, <laughs> that's the only reason I care. Um, <laughs> Dana immediately grabs her things. And Kevin's like, we're going. And she's like, heard that. Grabs all of her stuff. And they are on the run. Uh, Rufus runs into them on the road though and it's like you weren't going to say goodbye no Rufus why would she say goodbye no I was not but then out of nowhere Rufus pulls a gun on them and he's like you're coming home and you're gonna 
say we're gonna have dinner like what like a crazy like a crazy person and apparently like tom wants to talk to kevin and it's kevin's like no so we still don't know what's happening in this five-year gap um and rufus didn't want dana to leave him uh and she's like oh rufus like i want you to hang out and be here forever um and i can't lose you and as soon as this is all happening dana finally is fearing for her life and starting to lose her vision but she's like blacking out falling off a horse and at least it sounds like kevin might not be there she might bring a horse back in time we don't know that's how the chapter ends what a cliffhanger out of control truly (laughs) out of control Uh It took everything for me to not keep reading. And it's like the first time I felt like that. Because usually mm-hmm. in this book, I'm like, all right, we're going to take a break. We're I know. We're going to play a cute video game or watch Steven Universe mm-hmm. for 35 minutes. And then we're going to go back to reading. I had to cover the page. About humanity. <laughs> yeah. I, like, I can't know. Because it's the yeah. worst part, too, is the way this book's set up. Is it's oh, yeah. is you can just look directly to the right and see the next yep. chapter. And I was like, I can't. I can't. I had to cover it. I was like, I cannot look. Yeah, this is definitely a book where I feel like the next chapter should be the following page. Mm-hmm. But part of me wonders if people are just like too stubborn to like turn the page or whatever. Mm-hmm. I've never seen a book employ that yeah. in layout, but I feel like that would be really interesting, especially for like a horror book. Mm-hmm. And I think that this is a book that, you know, it's interesting. Someone asked me one time what genre this is. And I was like, oh, it's like sci-fi, but also historical fiction. And now I'm talking to you about it in this podcast. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, well, it's also kind of a horror yeah. story as well. So be ready for that i'm getting like thriller horror vibes like i'm yeah. terrified most of the time i'm reading this like i'm stressed yeah, in a out. serious way so stressed i know oh my goodness like i have to read it oh like goodness. it's not like i'm gonna i don't know i don't i haven't had any nightmares about it yet but i could see myself having nightmares about this like it stresses me out real yeah. bad real bad yeah like i read it mostly in public because it makes to keep your terror down yeah, a little bit and then like <laughs> well because the hard part too is every time i like i get so sucked in and then i look up and it's like my coworkers are like playing candy crush like that's the kind <laughs> of stuff i have to like come to terms with you know and then you're mad the rest of the day yep because of how the world actually works yep mm-hmm. yeah i know that vibe i was reading this one day on on my lunch break mm-hmm. and then i had a call that did not go well after mm. it and i was like i'm gonna stay silent the whole time because i am extremely fired yeah. up and i don't want to lose my job so i'm just gonna shut my mouth and listen i know <laughs> i turned my camera off i was like Beep. yeah <laughs> not today i know not today <laughs> there's some times where i read it too and people are like i was i i've had people make comments to me too about like uh politics while i've been reading this like, cause I told mm-hmm. them the plot and then they decided to tell me about their conservative views. And I was like, you know, oh, no. I would say this is at the time, but like, okay, <laughs> go off, <laughs> I guess. You want to throw verbal hands? We'll throw. I know. And it's like, <laughs> the hard chart too is like, people don't want to have an intelligent conversation. They just want to like, no. think I agree with them. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, cool. Yeah. That happens to Jason a lot too. Yeah. Jason actually, um, when he was looking for a new job, um, there was a place that was like a publication company. They were looking for um, a, like a lead designer, creative director. Mm-hmm. And uh, they were like, we really love your look. We saw you on LinkedIn. You look amazing. That's great. And of course, you've seen Jason. He's mm-hmm. like, you know, got dirty blonde hair, blue eyes. Um, when he grows out his beard, it's red. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Real ginger looking. Um, very pale, very pale skin, freckles, mm-hmm. all that, right? So he shows up right for the interview, which like it's during COVID. So everyone's still working from home. So luckily he didn't actually have to go into an office to have this conversation, Mm -hmm. but he gets a, he gets like a a video conference with this person and everything is going awesome. Right. Mm -hmm. Everything's great. Like it sounds like I'm hearing it. Like I'm inside, he's outside. I'm hearing, you know, like, cause he's on speaker, right. He's, he's doing a video conference call and I'm like, this guy is eating him Mm -hmm. up. Right. I'm only hearing, you know, Jason's side of it not what the guy is saying but like all his responses are obvious that this guy is loving it right Mm -hmm. so they get to like the end of the conversation Mm -hmm. and i hear jason's tone change and uh i see his body shift right his stance and like the way he's like his body language just like tightens up and i'm like Mm -hmm. oh no 
what happened? Yeah. What could this be? So he's just listening and he's nodding and he goes, mm-hmm. And so you decided to offer me, uh, you decided to, to reach out to me when you saw my LinkedIn picture. That's how you, uh, that's how you chose me. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it was my LinkedIn then that, that, that made you think that I was the ideal candidate for this position. Yeah, I see. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't talk. I don't know. You know what? No, I don't mind talking about politics. No, not at all. And I'm like, why is this person talking to him about politics Mm -hmm. for a design job? Like, what does that have to do with anything? So then he goes, yeah, no, I won't have any problem talking about my politics. I mean, you might have a problem with me talking about my politics, but I certainly won't. Do you want to get into it now? Let's get into it now. I don't mind. Go ahead. Yeah, let's talk. And like, I'm like, this, this is the worst interview I've ever heard. Like, how is this? What is going on? So he ends the call, right? He ends the call like maybe 10 minutes later after getting like real like, yeah, well, this is why I believe I believe Black Lives Matter. I believe gay and lesbian and trans people are equal and should always be. I believe in human rights. I believe in right. So he starts rattling off all these things he believes in that I also believe mm-hmm. in. I'm like, this is OK. I guess this is normal. Mm-hmm. So he comes in and he's crying laughing. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, what is going on with you? Now you're laughing like that sounded like a really messed up interview. Are you OK? Mm-hmm. It was the Daily Blaze. I don't know what that is. So the Daily Blaze is like an ultra conservative, like Tea Party Republican oh, no. <laughs> paper. So it was, uh, it was no, it wasn't the Daily Blaze actually. I think it was OAN. That's what it was, mm-hmm. One American Network, and they're even worse than the Daily Blaze. The Daily Blaze is again is Glenn Beck and Tommy Laren and all of those. People. Ah, okay. But, um, but this this was OAN or a subsidiary of OAN, which is like QAnon as well, right? So just very hard 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 right Mm -hmm. and i guess they like looked at jason and thought oh a brother a brother in arms he's pale he's very fair he has a big bushy beard and a shaved head that must mean something about Mm -hmm. him we're gonna offer him the job like this guy like thought he had his candidate he even told jason it's really hard for us getting people to work for us sometimes it's really difficult finding people jason's like it's pandemic how is it hard for you to find yeah. people? Like the whole conversation like suddenly revealed itself when this man was like, well, this is the, this is the, uh, the branch of this company that you'll be working under this one horrible. Cause the whole company isn't like that. It's like the whole company owns like different mm-hmm. properties and things like that. Right. Um, but this was specifically the assignment that they were looking for him to work on. And I think they thought because of the way he looks, that, mm-hmm. that was going to be enough for him to want to do that job. So trust that you are not the only white person that racist people feel like they want to tell all of their deepest, darkest secrets to. Yeah. It's also I, <laughs> like I live in a very Republican heavy area too, which yeah, doesn't help that matters. Doesn't help. No. You know, like basically <laughs> when I uh, vote, it's I'm dropping, it's a drop in the water. Like, yeah, it is what it is. It matters that you still do. Yeah. That. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. So that's all we got for today. That was crazy. I know. That's a lot. I'm kind of concerned because this is only the middle of the book. I know. And I feel like, like, I feel like this isn't the crescendo. This isn't like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. This isn't the climax of this book at all. So I'm very, we still don't know how this lady lost her arm. Mm -hmm. I'm just like, how much worse can this get, man? I know. (laughs) Where are we going next? Like, I know we're over halfway through. Yeah. I'm terrified for the next chapter so scared so scared yeah but i have a lot of feelings about it and i haven't even read it yet i know (laughs) maybe kevin didn't come back what if the horse comes back yo that'll be nuts that'll just be bonkers i will say though i mean in like you know it would be effective because i would not have seen that coming (laughs) i'm hoping that kevin was just an idiot and jumped on her yeah but at the same time i'm like I feel like he hasn't been smart enough to do that before. So yeah, she he better not come back again. He's a moron no. if he comes back again. No, once once he's back. But here's the thing, right? Here's here's really the part that I'm really like, hmm. So he's had five years mm-hmm. in there, right? He's aged a little bit. His hair is now whiter than it was. Yeah. When she last saw him, so it's not like he hasn't aged in this time mm-hmm. period. So, do all those wrinkles and stuff go away? Because it's been five years? Yeah. When he, like, comes back? Because we know that in our time, in, like, real life or whatever, mm-hmm. it's, like, seconds or days or, like, or like hours, right, that she's gone. Yeah. So if he's actually been there for five years, but for her it's been, like, a, not even a day mm-hmm. yet, 
like what does that mean for him i is his body changed forever is he gonna like melt into a puddle of i don't know but i also feel like he's gonna stay five years older than he was when he left because she doesn't leave like her bruises and beatings and scars come with her you know that's true so i think he has to age that's wild man that's crazy i mean how do people around them cope with that either it's like he's gonna be noticeably older now i mean what's good is that it's only five years yeah. and he's 35 i think when this starts yeah so it's 35 to 40 which isn't as extreme as like maybe like a 45 to 50 or a 55 to 60 might be yeah um but even then five years it's like a gradual kind of thing if it had been 10 years i would say that would be impossible yeah like they'd have to break up kevin would have to like become a new person yeah i mean that might happen anyway i mean he's been in only hope this horrific land for you know in the past for five years without her yeah to navigate him like no yeah. nope. but i don't feel good about it yeah next week we'll be continuing on we'll have even more to talk about i'm maybe i'll cry we'll see that seems how, like how things are going <laughs> yeah Maybe I'll edit it out. Maybe I'll leave my tears for you all. We'll see. Aww. But thank you so much for joining me, Candace. I'm having a wonderful time talking to you. I know I've been very chatty. This is a subject that I'm extremely passionate about. I mean, as we should be, right? Like, I said it once and I'll say it again. If people didn't want us to be chatty, they'd listen to the audiobook. That's true. Work. I thank everyone for listening yeah. and I thank you for having me yeah, here. Of course. Where can all the people on the internet find you, though? So you can find me um, on a variety of platforms like Instagram and uh, YouTube at Candace the Magnificent, all one word. That's Candace with an A. Um, And then you can also find me um, on uh, the Dungeon Jedi Masters theater podcast called Scattered Choices. You can find that on Spotify or Apple, iTunes, wherever it is that you get your, uh, your pods from. Um, that is a short series Star Wars 5e Dungeons and Dragons campaign that sounds more like a radio show. Um, you can also find me on YouTube or Twitch at Valor Studios, V-A-L-O-R-E, like lore, like uh, stories and storytelling, um, in a game called Deadlands, which is a Western, a Weird West themed uh, role playing game. Um, but yeah, if you want to just find me myself, definitely go to YouTube. I've got cute ice cream videos up there if you're into that kind of thing. I'm always into ice cream. Always, yeah. right? That's why I was like, this is a safe mm-hmm. option to like base some videos on because everyone wants yeah. that. I mean, honestly, craving it kind of right now. Yeah, me too. All right. <laughs> all right, but we'll catch you all next week. Bye. Bye. Thank you all so much for listening to this episode of the Barely Bookish Podcast. If you want more content, please consider joining us over on Patreon. Uh, All tiers are donation-based, so you get the same content no matter which tier you subscribe to. Uh, You get bonus access uh, to exclusive episodes every single month. You get to join the patron-only Discord. You get early access to every episode, so instead of having to wait until uh, Wednesday morning, uh, you get them on Monday morning, so that's fun. And you can start your week off with me and all the cool things we have to talk about. Next week, we are finally moving on to the next chapter. I am excited. I am loving this book. I will be recording um, the Kindred graphic novel soon with Candace. So that will be uh, available on Patreon when it's done. So make sure to stay tuned for that. um, As well as uh, get some cool bonus content over there. But I hope you all are having a lovely day. Thank you all so much for joining me. If you would like to hear more of me and see more of me, I'm at Barely Bookish on everything. I'm also on Twitch. So if you want to join for some writing sprints and some video games and all those kinds of things, go to twitch.tv slash Barely Bookish. And if you just want to hang out, just follow me on all my socials. Our logo is designed by my little sibling, Sarah. Our theme song was by Raphael Crux. And I'll catch you guys next week. Bye!